Thank you for joining with us. We continue our series uh, through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. I've entitled my message, The Way Up is the Way Down. And in our passage this morning, Jesus talks about the eternal value, uh, the incredible importance of children. You know, one of the greatest uh, joys at uh, our age is being grandparents. Uh, Margie right now is right back uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. and in New York uh, visiting five of our seven grandkids, and she is having such a wonderful time. I'm not sure she's coming back here to the island. <laughs> but I once heard about a grandson who asked his grandfather how it is that he got to be so old. And the grandfather smiled and said, well, to be honest, I sprinkle a little gunpowder on my oatmeal every morning for breakfast, every morning, gunpowder. The, grand, the grandson thought that was kind of weird, uh, but the grandfather did live a long life. He left a great legacy. He left a thriving career. He left a loving wife and seven children and 16 grandchildren. And he also left a 40-foot crater where the crematorium used to be. <laughs> well, here in our passage, Jesus wants his disciples to understand the importance of being childlike. But we know that it's, a, it's one thing to be childlike, it's another to be childish, and there's a huge difference. The problem is the disciples here were being childish uh, in more ways uh, than one. Now, I don't want to come down too hard on the disciples because they too often are just like each and every one of us, aren't they? But our passage here starts off with just one of those questions that shows just how adolescent, just how ambitious these disciples were. They were jockeying for position and wondering basically what the pecking order was in heaven. We see the disciples' question here in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Over in Mark's gospel, it tells us they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Now, I really don't know what prompted, basically, their question uh, here, but you might remember that Peter, James, and John had just come down uh, from the uh, mountaintop experience of actually seeing Jesus transfigured before their eyes. And I think it's possible that the other nine disciples who had been left there at the foot of the mountain, maybe they were basically feeling like Jesus was playing favorites. Maybe they felt, basically, that Jesus was neglecting them. I don't know. And so they started asking Jesus, who's who in the kingdom? Uh, who's going to be the greatest among all of us disciples? I mean, who's going to be the top dog, the head honcho, the big kahuna uh, when we get to heaven? I remember one of my sons asked me uh, who my favorite uh, son was, he or his brother. And I assured him, I said, you know what, you're my favorite, but I love your brother more. And he kind of looked at me, what? I said, yeah, you're the best, but your brother's number one. <laughs> I love messing with my kids. Jesus surprises his disciples here by picking up a child here from the crowd as an illustration of greatness. And he uses this little child basically as an object lesson. Matthew chapter 18, verse 2, he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to notice here that Jesus answers their question here by, by showing them two key things here that are so important. First of all, how to enter into heaven. How do you get through the door? With a simplicity of childlike faith. In other words, the quickest way up is the way down. Not to be childish, but to be childlike with the simplicity of childlike faith. You know, there are many today who really try to make salvation complicated. Uh, that in order to please God and to make it to heaven, you have to jump through a lot of religious hoops and perform a lot of ritualistic uh, complexities in order to qualify. And yet, the Lord has designed salvation to be really quite simple. All it takes is simple, childlike faith. It, and basically, doesn't that make sense? That our Lord would make the plan of salvation simple enough for even a child to understand and respond to in the simplicity of faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, that way, everybody can qualify. It's not rocket science. I remember the, the simple faith of one of those two criminals hanging on the cross next to Jesus. Luke 23, 39 tells us that and one of the criminals who were hanging there uh, was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, 
Remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now listen, that's, that criminal there was saved. How? I mean, there was no ritual he had to go through. There was no religious gymnastics he had to perform. There was no church membership that basically was required. He wasn't even baptized. He demonstrated just a simple, childlike faith that recognized his own sinful condition and realized who Jesus really was. And he simply said two words, remember me, remember me, and Jesus did. John 1 12 says, but as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And so Jesus here answers the disciples' questions by showing them how to get into the door, how to enter into heaven with the simplicity of childlike faith. But he also shows them how to be the greatest in the kingdom with the humility of childlike faith. In verse 4 it says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We must go down before God will lift us up. Winston Churchill was once asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed with overflowing? Yes, <laughs> replied Sir Winston. It is quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I'm always reminded that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, well, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin once admitted, the problem with humility is that the moment that you think you've attained it, you've lost it. It is impossible, basically, to be proud about your humility. But in all of history, the great saints were the humble saints. We must go down before God will lift us up. 1 Peter 5, 5, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and that he may exalt you at the proper time. And while we know that obviously children aren't perfect, they're not sinless, they do have certain humble characteristics that should characterize the life of every believer. And so what is it about a child that we are to be like? What did Jesus see in children that is so vitally important? I see at least four positive key characteristics of a child. A child tends to be teachable in his understanding, simple in his wants, expectant in his attitudes, and dependent upon his father to meet his needs. And that's exactly how the Lord wants each and every one of us, to be teachable in our understanding, simple in our wants, expectant in our attitudes, and dependent upon the father to meet our needs. And of course, when you think about it, the only way we can become a child again is to be born again. We need to be born again. There was a very sophisticated, very dignified man by the name of Nicodemus who came to Jesus one time. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, uh, which was a religious group of teachers and leaders that numbered about 6,000 in Israel at that time. And the thing about Pharisees was that they were religious, they were pious, proud, and legalistic to the bone. And that, and that was the best thing that you could say about them. Externally, Jesus said they were like whitewashed tombs. They looked good on the outside, but inside, internally, they were dead men's bones. John 3, 1 tells us, Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know, don't know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus uh, answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, Jesus was saying, uh, Nick, it's not enough that you're a Jew, you must be born again. It's not enough that you're religious, Nick, you must be born again. It's not enough that you know the law, 
You must be born again. It's not enough that you're a religious leader. You must be born again. You need to start all over again as a child of faith. You must be born again. Now, in verse 6, we have the warning. Uh, verse 6 says, For whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, the milling of grain at that time was done by the grinding of grain between two very uh, large flat stones. Each of these stones was about 18 inches in diameter, about the size of a large manhole cover, and about three to four inches thick, and they were heavy. In fact, the upper millstone was so heavy, it had to be turned from the harness of a donkey who walked around it in circles. And so to have a millstone actually hung around your neck would drag you to the bottom real quick. The point is this, that Jesus is talking about the severe judgment for the person who causes a child of God to stumble or trip in his or her faith. In other words, it's an extremely dangerous thing for a parent or any adult, for that matter, to cause a child to stumble, trip, and fall from the path of salvation. For example, as a parent, we can sacrifice our children on the altar of our own careers. We can sacrifice our kids on the altar of our own dreams, our own ambitions, our hobbies, our interests, our uh, sports, our education. And there's a lot of backslidden parents and a lot of worldly-minded adults who have to answer someday for that at judgment. Money and materialism can become more important than our own children. John Piper once observed this. He said, the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the prime time dribble of triviality that we drink in every night. For all the ill that Satan could do, when God describes what keeps us from the banquet table of his love, it's a piece of land, a yoke of oxen, and a spouse. The greatest adverse uh, adversary of love to God is not his enemies, but his gifts. And the most deadly appetites are not the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. And our children are often sacrificed in the process. How critically important it is to be godly examples in our home, in our church, in our community, to our kids. Now, these little ones that Jesus is referring to here, in a greater sense, are really all of the children of God. In fact, dozens of times in the New Testament, the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are referred to as God's children. We are all God's little children. And so, in a broader sense, Jesus here warns us that it is a grave mistake, it is a serious tragedy, if we ever cause any other fellow brother or sister in the Lord to stumble and trip up in their faith. Jesus states in verse 7, Woe to the world because of, it, of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to the man through whom the stumbling blocks come. On top of that, Jesus goes on to point out here that we can also be guilty of causing ourselves to stumble. How serious is that? So serious that Jesus puts it this way in verse 8, And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast in to the fiery hell. Now listen, that's pretty serious. Causing yourself to stumble brings with it the possibility of hell itself. And Jesus seems to be indicating here that even self-mutilation is preferred rather than to end up there. Now, there have been some who have taken these words of Jesus very literally and to the extreme. In fact, some in uh, church history have actually mutilated themselves to prevent further sin. If you had to go to that extreme uh, to not sin, uh, you were considered in the early church to be very spiritual. For example, castration was a common thing in the days of the early church and was actually seen as a virtue. One of the early church fathers, Origen, uh, who was a great theologian, an awesome, passionate man of God, actually castrated himself as a young Christian to keep from the temptation of lust and sexual immorality. Later in life, he truly regretted it. But literal self-mutilation is not what Jesus was talking about here. His words were obviously meant to be 
figurative. How do we know that? A couple of reasons. First of all, we know that Jesus had said time and time again that the root of sin is not found in the hands, feet, or eyes, but in the heart. In Matthew 15, 19, Jesus declared, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. In other words, sin has its root in the heart. We desperately need a heart transplant, and only God can do that. Secondly, when you think about it, logically, even if you remove a body part, you can still fall into sin. A thief can still covet and even steal without hands or feet. A blind man, even a eunuch, can still struggle with lust and sin. And so obviously the problem is not found in some outward physical part of the body. Thirdly, if eliminating body parts is what keeps us from sinning, then all of us will undoubtedly have to roll into heaven someday as a mutilated stump. Now the problem, again, of course, is that even a mutilated stump can still have a wicked heart. And so the deeper question is always who you are on the inside. It's a heart issue. And so what is Jesus really talking about here with all this amputee talk? I think the old Puritan, uh, George Bena Boardman, put it best. He says, whatever occasions you to sin, remove it promptly, wholly, even though it pain you as much as the plucking out of the right eye or the cutting off of the right hand. In other words, it's basically doing whatever it takes to rid yourself of sin, to get rid of sin. I have a good friend, for example, who won't go to the beach. He hasn't gone to the beach in 40 years because of the skimpy bathing suits or the lack thereof that you see today. And I know that's radical, but he's doing whatever it takes to keep lust from his heart. He's taking sin. He's taking temptation seriously. You might remember the incident that happened a few years ago at Canyonlands National Park in Utah. They made a movie about it called 127 Hours. On Saturday, April 26, 2003, Aaron Ralston set out climbing in Blue John Canyon for what was to be a one-day hike. But as he used climbing gear to negotiate narrow canyons, he, the, the unthinkable happened. Ralston put his arm into a crack in the canyon wall, and an 800-pound boulder shifted and pinned him. He tried to use an adult pocket knife to chip away at the boulder without success. He tried to rig a makeshift pulley with ropes to lift the boulder, and that failed as well. And after three days, having gone through most of his three liters of water and food, he decided to sacrifice his arm in order to save his life. First bending his body in order to break his wrist bone, he proceeded to use his knife to amputate his arm just below the right elbow. Amazingly, able to remain conscious, the 27-year-old climber applied a makeshift tourniquet and repelled 60 feet to the canyon floor. I'm not sure how I handled it, he said, the stump of his right arm in a sling. I felt pain, and I coped with it, and I moved on. According to one official, Ralston would have died if he had stayed there in the canyon. He had an extreme will to live. Although Jesus here spoke in figurative language, he challenged his followers to make similarly painful decisions for the sake of their spiritual survival. Like Aaron Ralston, those who want to follow Jesus oftentimes have to face tough choices. Listen, we all have sinful habits that we want to keep sometimes as badly as our right arm. But we also have a Lord and Savior who calls us to repent, to deal with our sin no matter what the cost. And Jesus is telling us here to deal with our sins drastically, completely, and mercilessly the way a surgeon basically deals with a cancerous growth. To keep from stumbling, we have to face our sins honestly and then humbly confess and forsake them, no matter what. To keep from offending and stumbling, radical changes are often necessary. And it often takes an incredible amount of courage and faith to cut off our wickedness. But God gives us that strength. In Colossians 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul tells us how, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. 
Now again, all of that takes a heart transplant, and only Christ can create within us a new heart. And we desperately need that. And so we can cause ourselves to stumble, but we can also cause others to stumble. In Matthew 18, verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now Jesus here validates a current Jewish thought. The belief in what has been called guardian angels or ministering spirits. Referring to angels, Hebrews 1.14 tells us, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot more about what these angels do. But the point is that Jesus is making uh, here that the children of God are of such tremendous value that they are assigned an angel. Think about that. To continually behold the face of the Father. That means that they are in his immediate presence. I read a story once about the famous singer Johnny Cash. It told of how Johnny Cash, when he was a boy, had witnessed his older brother Jack's gruesome death from a table saw accident. Tragedy. Just before his brother died, in his arms, Jack Cash's final words, just before he passed, was that he heard angels singing. Johnny Cash responded by turning his life over to Christ. When those five missionaries were speared to death in the jungles of Ecuador back in 1956, the killers later became Christians. Why? One of the reasons was that each of them testified that as soon as they killed those five young men, they suddenly looked across the jungle river and saw and heard angels singing just above the treetops. Now, I don't necessarily believe every angel story that I hear, but I do believe that every believer has an assigned angel. Now, that ought to really help motivate us in the way that we treat one another. Listen, the fact is that, the, that that precious brother or sister sitting next to you has a personal representative who stands before the very throne of God in heaven. C.S. Lewis described it like this. He said, it's a serious thing, he says, to live in a society and to remember that the dullest and the most uninteresting person that you talk to one day may be a creature which, if you saw him then, would be you would be strongly tempted to worship or that person could be a horror and a corruption such as now you meet only in a nightmare he says all day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations it is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Therefore, we are to take each other seriously. No flippancy, no superiority, no presumption, and our charity must be real and costly as love with deep feeling of grief for their sins, although we love the sinner. Every child of God is of tremendous value and of eternal worth. That Jesus here illustrates it in verse 12 with a parable. What do you think, he says, if any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. Thus, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Our great shepherd here loves us so much that he goes after that one sheep out of a hundred. Not even one is expendable. Not one. And so here in our passage, Jesus gives us five reasons why the children of God are so valuable, so incredibly important to him. First of all, they are examples of true greatness. Secondly, they represent Christ. Thirdly, the angels represent them before the Father. Fourthly, Christ desires to save them. And then finally, it is the will of the Father that they be rescued from destruction. By way of application this morning, you know, I'm convinced that most of us don't live life like we should. We let the real purpose and real meaning of life slip by so easily. But it is the children, I think, who really know how to live. They're so intense in both their joy and their sorrows. When my three-year-old grandson cries, I mean, he wails. Uh, when he's happy, he giggles loudly and he squeals with delight. 
Not only are they intense, children are so trusting in their outlook of the world and in their belief in God. So what is it about the importance of children that Jesus really wants us to understand? How can we develop a greater childlike simplicity in our faith? Well, three things in closing, really quickly. First of all, children have no doubts about their real importance. They don't. They don't have any doubts about it. We adults, I think, are way too worried, way too concerned about our self-image and our ego. I heard about a child once who finds his five-year-old girl standing with her arms up in the window during a thunderstorm with the lightning flashing all around. And she says, Daddy, I think God's trying to take my picture. <laughs> she knows her worth. She knows her value. To live life fully, we have to feel good about who we really are in Christ Jesus. Most of us don't. Jesus came to cleanse us from that dark side, to impute into us his righteousness, to impart to us his eternal life. And children have no doubts about their real importance, and neither should we. Secondly, children have a quality of spontaneous joy. God wants us to be free from the bondage and the burdens that keep us from truly enjoying life. Jesus said, I come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And so why is it that so many are not experiencing that abundant life that Jesus has promised? A boy at Disneyland begs his dad to ride Space Mountain one more time, again and again and again. He wants to ride it over and over. He says Space Mountain, riding Space Mountain makes him happy. And so he tells his father, Dad, I think Jesus would enjoy it if I got another ride. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton once said, I think God is the only child left in the universe. And all the rest of us have grown old and cynical because of sin. Children have a quality of spontaneous joy that reflects their Heavenly Father. Thirdly, children have absolute confidence in the future. You know, society hasn't beaten them down yet. They still have their dreams for the future. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus creates within us new dreams. He who imparts spontaneous joy and dreams to children also imparts them to each and every one of us. Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells his children this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Someone once said that a person is old, when his memories are more precious than his visions of the future. The gospel makes us fully alive and makes us into little children. And so may we grow more childlike in our faith and our response to him. Luke 18, 16, Jesus called for them saying, permit the children to come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have called us uh, to yourself, that we are in relationship with you, and that you've called us to be childlike, not childish, not immature. But Father, we are called to grow in you in childlike simplicity in our faith and in our joy of who we are. Father, I just pray that you would instill within us, Lord, that, that new passion, that, that new heart that reflects what it means to be born again. Lord, I pray that you would help us to uh, keep our eyes focused on you, to walk in humility, to walk in your spirit, to keep our eyes focused on you, realizing that all of our needs uh, are provided by you who love us unconditionally. And so, Father, I just pray that you would uh, uh, help us to continue to be molded and shaped into the image of Jesus. May the words of our mouth and meditations of our heart always be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.